that I thank you for being here and I thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak into your life. This message is a little unusual for me. I, um, I usually preach revival messages and I'm sure this is probably going to be a revival type message but it's different. This is a message the Lord has just given me. It's on my heart heavy. It's a, it's a strong word. It's a stiff word. It may be offended. It may be a, some of you may be offended when you hear it, but just let it work in you, and I believe it will yield a peaceable fruit. I really believe that. This is, um, this is, I believe, a prophetic message tonight. I believe it's a warning. I had a dream last week. And not all the dreams that I have do I put a lot of stock in them, but I had, a, I had a very unusual and a very powerful dream last week, and I'll tell you more about it in the message. And uh, it shook me. And uh, the message that I'm going to bring tonight is a sober, somber word, and I feel it deep, and I hope I'm going to be able to articulate it the way that I feel it. Those of you that are watching by television in the different nations of the world, especially here in America, I want you to listen carefully because, like I said a moment ago, I do believe this is prophetic, and I believe that the Lord is calling out maybe one of the final times to this nation. So I want you to look with me, if you will, in the King James Version. For those of you that don't have your Bibles, it'll be on the screen. I do read different versions, but I, I like to preach out of the King James Version because it says it many times the way I like for it to be said in regard to other translations, but I like the King James especially. But there's a passage of Scripture tonight that I want to talk about. I want to take this as my text. It says in the book of Psalms, chapter 66 and verse 18, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Would you please read that out loud with me, everybody? If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. And I want you to read it one more time. There's another passage that I'm going to read in the book of Isaiah. It's in chapter 59, verses 1 through 3. It said, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear, but your hands are defiled with blood. I want you to be seated, if you will, please, and for about the next 45, 50 minutes, I want to bring you, I believe, a strong warning, not just to Christ for the nations, for sure, but I want to bring a strong warning hopefully to the peoples of this nation and the nations of the world. I think all of us realize that something is going on we don't quite know what. I know in my heart there's an unspoken thing going on that I can't even articulate. That I feel that something is pending. That's a good way to put it. You can feel it. Even sinners on the street know that something is pending. We don't know what. The thing that sort of shocks me is, though, that I believe a lot of times sinners feel things that Christians are not feeling. And I believe that in the church, the church has become sort of inoculated to the voice of the Lord and to the things that's going on in the world. And I think in many cases, ministers behind the pulpits have tried to convince people that these things are not pending and that nothing is about to happen, that everything is cool. But I don't think that I'm standing before a crowd tonight that believes that. I think we all know that something is up, don't we? And I know beyond a doubt that this message that I'm going to bring tonight is going to shake some of you. Some of you is going to, you're going to affirm it and you're going to bless it and say amen, but some of the rest of you will listen to it and you'll sort of shy away from it. But I believe that the wrath of God is about to be poured out upon the earth and especially in America. And let me tell you one of the reasons why. We have entered into a strange time that I believe that people are confused now. Pulpits have abandoned preaching 
the unadulterated Word of God. Preachers are preaching things today that is confusing, especially young people. There's things coming out from pulpits that are pleasant, easy to hear. Seminars now and conventions are teaching preachers to how to get people in their church without offending people and making it really nice so that people leave, leave feeling good about everything, especially themselves. But how many of you know you can't get a person saved until you get them lost? Amen. You can't get a person saved until the conviction of the Holy Spirit falls upon them. And a person can't get saved anytime they want to get saved. You have to have the Holy Spirit draw you. And except the Spirit draws a person, they can't come to God on their own terms. So conviction has to fall. And that's one of the things today in our churches that's become so offensive is people are ashamed for the Holy Spirit to fall in a service. And they're ashamed for conviction to grip people, especially when they are brought to tears and crying. And a lot of times in our churches when people are brought to tears and they cry, there's no appeal given by the minister for people to come and receive the Lord as their Savior anymore. Not only that, are people not invited to be saved anymore in our churches, but in many of our Pentecostal and Charismatic churches, the gifts of the Holy Spirit are not allowed to flow anymore. There are no messages in tongues and interpretation where the power of God touches someone that has the gift of the Holy Spirit. And they can give out a powerful message in tongues and the interpretation comes and it shakes the crowd. It shakes individuals to where they're brought to conviction and they want to change their lives. Now all that's been rele relegated to another room in the church somewhere of less importance because now we put people above the moving of the Holy Spirit. But may I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, we must never put people above the precious Holy Spirit. And we, I'm seeing a strange phenomenon happen. I think I'm shocked to see it here so soon. I didn't really think it would be here this soon, but to see it, it shocks me. America has always known how to pray, but an element in prayer that's going to bring the judgment of God on this nation is now that we're being taught by ministers to learn how to pray without repenting. Now I want to stay on this for a few minutes. I'm amazed at how preachers preach today. And listen, I am a preacher, so I'm pointing a finger at myself also. So I don't have an ax to grind with anybody anywhere under any conditions. But we are entering into a season now in the American church where people come in and they're being taught how to pray, but they're not being brought to repentance. And because there's no repenting, you have people that has never repented of their sins filling our church pews that's praying, but they've never repented. And one of the reasons why there's no repentance being preached is whenever a person really begins to repent and make things right with God, sometimes it's a little messy. I think it was a bad day when we took God out of our schools, but I think it was a worse day when we took the altars out of the church. And I don't think that you need a physical board uh, altar made out of planks and boards to have an altar in the church. But I do think that invitations need to be given in our churches when conviction of the Holy Spirit falls and a preacher preaches and the conviction of God comes in that place. I believe that there must be an appeal given to people to come receive the Lord. And there must be a time of prayer. There must be a time of tears and of repenting. I remember at the Brownsville Revival that God gave me the high, high honor of pastoring during 1995 through the year 2000. I was at Brownsville for 22 years as the pastor. And when revival broke out, one of the phenomenons that I saw 
is that God sent an evangelist to Brownsville and he preached, Steve Hill, and he preached with one of the strongest voices of repentance that I've ever heard. And Steve now, of course, lives here in Dallas. I admire him and love him deeply. But he had a voice that could call out and there was a sense of emergency in his voice when he preached. There was a cry in his voice. It was never condemning. It was never belittling. I've seen him preach many times with conviction in his heart. And he would ask the Lord to come with conviction and bring sinners to the altar. And I've literally seen grown men that had never been to church before. One of the blessings about the Brownsville Revival was it brought people into that church that had never darkened the doors of a church ever in their life. Men and women and young people. And whenever he would preach and the conviction, convicting power of the Holy Spirit would fall, I've seen grown men grab hold of the back of the pew and would freeze and their knuckles would turn white and they couldn't even lift their foot to walk to the altar. And I've seen people fall between the pews crying out to God for mercy and you could hear it all over the church. Many, many scores of people crying out to God for mercy. And we trained our ushers to go back there and scoop them up from between the pews and help them get down to the front so they could pray through to an old time salvation. Friend, I tell you that's the answer for America is old time, old fashioned Pentecostal revival. That's what it's gonna take. And I've seen, I've seen grown men and I've seen women. I've seen prostitutes come to the Lord. I've seen people get saved by the hundreds of thousands in the Brownsville Revival. In the first revival that we had at Brownsville, there wasn't so many miracles, but there was hundreds and hundreds of thousands of salvation. Four and a half million people came through those doors in five years from 95 to 2000. In the revival that we're having now with Nathan Morris, not only is he calling forth people to repentance, but also God's giving signs and wonders and miracles in this revival. May I tell you something? I believe that the only hope now for America is old-fashioned revival again. God send revival to America one more time. I believe it's the answer. But now what we're doing in America is we're having people sired up in our pews that's learning how to pray, but they've never repented. Never been given the opportunity to repent many times unless it's at home or a friend has led them in a prayer of repentance. They're not getting it in church. I'm seeing that America has always known how to pray in a crisis, but a key element that I believe is going to bring judgment to this nation is that this nation is now praying. We've become real religious and we're praying but America has lost the ability to repent. I want you to listen to a statement. I'm going to say it very carefully so you won't misunderstand me. But a sinner does not have the same standing with God that a saint does. Y'all listening to me? A sinner does not have the same standing with God that a saint does. A saint has repented. They have fell under conviction. They've repented, they've confessed their sins, they've been washed in the blood, the Holy Spirit has come into their life, and God hears their prayers. But a phenomenon that's taking place today in America is that now we're hearing messages preached to where there is no call for repentance. People come and they hear about prayer and they hear about church and functions and all that, and they get in and now all of a sudden they're starting to pray but they've never been brought to repentance. And it's scary that that's happening in the church. It's happening all over this nation, in all denominations. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs, chapter 15 and verse 8, it says, the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. Look at that one more time. It's on the screen. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to God. They have not repented of their sins, but they're bringing sacrifices, they're praying, and God says it's an abomination. But the prayer of the upright, God delights in it. Proverbs 15, 29 says, the Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayer of the righteous. He's far from the wicked. I don't care if the wicked is praying. 
I don't care if they're talking to God and, and going through all the religious calisthenics. If they haven't prayed the prayer of repentance, if they haven't turned from their sins, the Bible said their prayer is an abomination. And they have no standing with God. A saint has a standing, but a sinner has no standing with God. In Psalms 24, it said, Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, and has not lifted up his soul into vanity, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessing from the Lord, and righteousness from God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek his face. First John says this in chapter 3, verse 22. Whatsoever we ask, we receive of him, because we keep his commandments, and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. That's a saint for you. One key factor of the tribulation that's going to begin, I believe, before too very long. I do believe in the, that the Lord is about to come, and right after he comes, the tribulation is going to begin. But one of the key things that you'll notice in the Bible concerning the tribulation period is, it says in Revelation 9.20, the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues repented not of the work of their hands, that they should worship devils and idols of gold and silver, and brass and stone and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. They refuse to repent. In the tribulation with things happening that you will know beyond any doubt is God and God's angels bringing it to pass, men still refuse to repent. And just as that is going to be in the world, it's already crept into the church. It's hard to get people to repent anymore. I have pastored since 1970. I've been a pastor now for almost 42 years, and I've pastored five churches. I've seen a phenomenon creep in some time ago that now when church people are wrong, you can't hardly get them to repent anymore and admit they're wrong. They'll want to blame somebody else. It's very difficult anymore to find a husband that will really truly repent to his wife and ask his wife to forgive him. Really hard anymore to find a woman that will truly repent to her husband and ask her to forgive him for doing him wrong or letting the family down. It's hard to find parents that will ask their children to forgive them. It's hard to find young people and children that will ask their parents to forgive them. It's a missing quality out of American life. And what I'm trying to tell you is I believe that the church has become so Americanized. We've become so independent that now we're not going to have anybody telling us what to do, including a preacher or our pastor. We're going to do what's right in our own sight. But friend, that's not the word of God. God said, except you repent, you shall all perish. One of the things that um, I'm stricken by in days past, as a nation in America turned to God in trouble in a crisis, presidents would call the nation to prayer and repentance back in bygone eras. Governors would call the country and their, they would call their states back to God and to repent. Civic leaders, local civic leaders would do the same. They would call a day of prayer, they'd call a time of fasting and repentance in times of calamity. But today, a preacher, or, or I'm sorry, a politician would be laughed to scorn if he tried to call a time of fasting and prayer for his state. A governor would be laughed to scorn. I remember whenever Governor Perry was about to run for president, he called a time of prayer and fasting in Houston. Regardless of what you think about Governor Perry, I admire him for trying to call the state of Texas to fasting and prayer. I admire him. And here's what I'm trying to say. He was laughed to scorn by the elite media in America. And there were times in this nation that our presidents would call on the people of the nation to 
repent before God and to turn from our sins and to, to, to go before God in a season of fasting and prayer and ask God to turn calamities. And America would pray and we'd hear the cry of our presidents and we would pray. But today it seems like presidents want to ask other nations to forgive us but not ask God to forgive us. Are you listening to me? I said we're quick to ask other nations to forgive us, but what about asking God to forgive us? Friend, it makes no difference about other nations or world leaders. We need to ask God to have mercy upon us and forgive us of our sins. We're no longer willing to acknowledge mistakes. We're no longer willing to take responsibility for sin. It's somebody else's fault. We're no longer willing to be accountable for our actions. And if the pastor tries, he'll lose people by hordes. We see it now, not only in politics, but we see it in church, the same thing. We even see that people of stature, now when they die, the ministers at their funerals will not put a premium on holiness anymore and walking with God anymore. They won't put a premium on asking God for forgiveness. I wonder sometime how the Holy Spirit feels whenever he's not asked to deliver and set free from addictions. Are you listening to me? Like I told you, friend, I don't have an ax to grind. I'm just trying to preach the word of God. And I want you to hear the cry of my heart. There's a wrong message that's going out today from our pulpits. And it's time that we begin to return back to God and repent and ask God for mercy. You can't live any way you want to live and still have the kiss of God and the touch of God on you. And you cannot live any way you want to live as a congregation and still have a move of God in your church or the glory of God settle on your church. We've got to live holy in these days. And if there's ever been a day that we need to live holy and preachers need to cry out for our holiness, now is the time. But no, you don't hear the voices at all hardly in this hour. Now in a time when we need to hear Bible prophecy preached with great fervor like we've never heard it preached, now we don't hear it preached behind our pulpits. And if there's ever been a time that we need to hear preached about the rapture of the church or the soon coming of Jesus Christ, it's an absent subject in most of our churches. It's troubling. After you've been in revival like we have, in Brownsville and now in this revival, you begin to really suddenly realize how important revival is in the life of a church and in the life of people. I remember so well when revival broke out the first time, we were in services night after night after night. Steve and I would not say goodbye to each other until well after daylight the next morning. We went night after night after night, week after week, month after month. I can't explain it, but it seemed like God would never really move in full power till after midnight. I don't know why, but it would seem like God would never really move in full power till after midnight. It reminds you in the Bible of Paul and Silas at midnight they prayed and the place was shaken. I think it so excites the Holy Spirit to see people staying in church till midnight that he says, I think I'm going to go there and bless my people. That's what I think is happening. It's the, it's the fading of one day and the emerging of another day. Two days, one's going and one's coming. And people are still in the house of God. I've looked up many times at 3 o'clock in the morning and I would see the church is full at 3 o'clock in the morning as it was at 7 when we started. People, it seemed like God would never really move until after that midnight hour. And people were called to the ministry. People were filled with the Holy Spirit. Their bodies were healed. People were repenting and getting right with God. And me and Steve said goodbye many times after the sun had come up the next morning. You didn't want to leave that atmosphere. And now, after weeks and weeks and weeks of that, finally one day we said we're going to take off and just have a time of rest. We're just going to take off a night. I think it was a Tuesday. And I'll never forget, it was on a Tuesday, and we didn't have church that night after being in church every night for oh, I don't know how long. And my wife was at home cooking. And I remember I had the television on. 
I just cut the television on it, and it was just the simplest commercial. Nothing filthy about it, nothing vulgar. Just the simplest commercial came on. And that commercial so struck and smote my heart because it was so radically different from the atmosphere I've been used to now for weeks and months in the holy presence of God that just a normal commercial smote me and I run over there and cut the television off and I said, Lord, please don't let your presence leave me. Friend, it's been so long since most people in our churches have felt the presence of God. David said, Lord, take not your Holy Spirit from me. But if you've never been used to the moving of the Holy Spirit, you don't know how that feels. And that's what I'm praying before Christ comes, that God will give another deluge and a great awakening of the Holy Ghost. I looked in the scriptures and I was really amazed as I began to notice as I read about Sodom and Gomorrah I was really shocked to learn something in Ezekiel it says that this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom and it lists three sins it says pride fullness of bread an abundance of idleness. That was the three sons of Sodom. It says it right there on the screen. Look at it in the King James Version, verse 49. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness was in her. But have you noticed something? Look this way. Homosexuality wasn't mentioned. Homosexuality was never mentioned in this passage of Scripture. It never said that God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah because of homosexuality. It said they had three sins. Number one was pride. Let me talk about that for a moment. The Bible said the wicked, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. God is not in all of his thoughts. Did you know, friend, today, if pastors call to their congregation to come during the week and to seek the face of God, I wonder how many congregations across America would come and seek after God. The more pride there is in a church, the more pride there is in a local body, the less they have on their mind seeking God. It says the wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek after God. God is not in all of his thoughts. I don't know about you, but every day that I live, God is in my thoughts from early morning till the time I go to bed at night. I don't know about you, friend, but my mind is stayed on him and fixed on him all day long. I'm thinking of his return. I'm thinking of people being saved. I'm thinking of my family being touched and used by God. That's all I think of all day long. If I couldn't think about God, Lord, go ahead and take me. But the Bible says that those that have pride, they don't have their mind on the Lord. And then the Bible also says that pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. The proud have no room in their hearts for God. To acknowledge God and to depend on him would suggest that we're fallible and that we're in need. In the book of Revelation chapter 3 it says this, Unto the angel of the church at Laodicea write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works. You're neither hot nor cold, and I would that you were hot or cold. So because you're lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spew you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. You don't know that you're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I think one of the things that I want to say tonight is, It is a very dangerous thing to want to become a leader of a country or a leader of a city or a leader of a church even. In today's world, it's a dangerous thing to become a leader, and I'm going to show it to you in the scriptures, especially those that have pride on them. In the days of Daniel, the Bible said that there was a king by the name of Nebuchadnezzar and he was filled with pride as he looked upon the capital city of Babylon. And this is what he said. Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house 
of the kingdom by the might of my power and the honor of my majesty? And the Bible says this in the next verse. It says, while the word was still in the king's mouth, there came a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, thy kingdom is departed from thee. They shall drive you from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven times shall pass over you, until you know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. And the same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar, and he was driven from men and did eat grass as an ox. His body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hairs were grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. Because he took the glory for the nation and how that nation was, because he took the glory, he was smitten by God with great judgment. And then the Bible said after seven times, seven years, he repented. And it said, at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes to heaven, and my eye and my understanding returned unto me, and I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that lives forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, that none can stay his hand, or say unto him, what are you doing? At the same time, my reason returned unto me, and for the glory of my kingdom, mine honor and the brightness returned unto me, and my counselors and my lords saw unto me, and I was established in my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added unto me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all whose works are truth and his ways judgment, and those that walk in pride he is able to abase. I believe with all my heart, and I want you to please hear me, that America is in dire danger. We see it every night on the news. We see it all day long on the 24-hour newscast. We see what is happening and how men are taking credit, how the, the good is being distorted and even turned into lies. It's a dangerous thing to want high office and not give the glory to God. Even in the scriptures, Herod took the glory and took the worship and worms ate him until he died. In Obadiah, there may be a scripture here that might refer to America. I'm not sure. I just want you to listen to it. It said, The pride of thine heart has deceived thee, thou, and the, thou that dwellest upon the clefts, uh, thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, Who shall bring me down to the ground? Though you exalt yourself as the eagle, and though you set thy nest among the stars, thence will I bring you down, says the Lord. And it says, exalt yourself as an eagle, and thy nest among the stars. Could this prophecy be a veiled scripture concerning America? Because the symbol of America is the eagle. The national anthem, the star-spangled banner, the national march, stars and stripes forever. It talks about the stars. Our space exploration, we were the first to walk on the moon, and Neil Armstrong said the eagle has landed. And we're now so entrenched in pride that we have the same status as Sodom. And I wonder, do we really believe that we can escape? The next thing is, it says fullness of bread. What was given by God as a blessing to the children of Israel, it deteriorated into a sin. Because they kept the word of the Lord and because they obeyed God, God gave them bread and plenty, surplus on every hand. But they did not discipline themselves to properly appreciate the blessings of God as they were intended. And surplus has a way of opening the door for excess. Now I want you to listen to me for what I'm about to say. We took the blessings, but we forgot the blesser. In Proverbs 23 and verse 20, it says, Drunks and gluttons are the result of excessive living. It says, Be not among wine-bibbers or riotous eaters of flesh. I told you I was probably going to offend some of you. But I am so concerned about the attitude 
of God's people now that has become so lenient about drinking. I am shocked at how now even ministers have wine collections. I'm shocked at how preachers will not cry out and there's young people coming up in our pews that never hears a voice of conviction. And they never hear scriptures like this covered. And there's a generation coming up in our pews that never hears anything about anything like this. And so they grow up thinking that everything's normal. But friend, if it was wrong for the, for the forerunner of Jesus Christ, John the Baptist, to drink, why do we think it was all right for Christ to drink? If he forbid his forerunner to drink, don't you know that it wasn't right for him to drink? But there is so much that's going on today in the church world where you'll find arguments now, strong arguments from people that are good people saying it's okay to drink. I'll tell you a case in point in my own church. I have a young man here tonight. His uncle came to, to a church of his presence and loved me dearly. This is before revival broke out the last time. Loved me dearly. And he got saved. He was an alcoholic. He got saved. Touched by the fire of God, radically changed. His family was in awe of the changes that he made. After he'd been there for a couple of years or so, he went out one night to a restaurant to eat, and he saw some of our people sitting there drinking at the restaurant. And he said to them, he said, what, what are you doing that for? They said, well, don't you know it's okay to drink as a Christian? Just do everything in moderation. It's okay. And they passed him a drink, and he took a drink. And in just a matter of days, he had fell off the wagon, went back totally in sin, and lost his daughters and his sons and his whole family members. They all just rode him off, and they won't have anything to do with him because the church member said it's okay to drink. May I stand here tonight and tell you it's a dangerous thing to tell somebody it's all right to drink whenever the Word of God says it's not. I know that's tough. I said I know that's tough, but yet I'm telling you I'm crying out. We need to give back to God and be willing to repent of the things that God talks to us about. If God puts his finger on alcohol in your life, you need to be quick to give it up and say, Jesus, whatever it takes, Lord, but don't take your spirit from me. Come on, shout amen. amen. I'm going to jump ahead. If there's one thing, and I'm not one of these kind of preachers, this is unusual for me to preach like this. But after what happened to me last week, I've got to cry out. I believe that the sin, probably, that's going to bring judgment on America and this building up and amortizing every day, I believe that the sin that's going to bring America down is the sin of shedding innocent blood. Let me show you what I'm talking about. I was reading the other night, and I've never seen this before, and when I saw it, it just shocked me. We, since 19, whenever they passed the Roe versus Wade, we have killed 40 million babies in this nation alone. 40 million babies. When you look in the scriptures, and you see that God came to Cain, and he said, where's your brother Abel? You know what Abel said? You know what Cain said? He said, am I my brother's keeper? In other words, what has that got to do with me? And here's what God said. He used a word that I'd never seen before. He said, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. And when I saw that word blood, it comes from the root Hebrew word demay, D-E-M-A-Y. And it doesn't read, thy brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. It says, thy brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. What he was saying is, you didn't just kill your brother, but you killed his sons and his daughters and his grandchildren and his great-grandchildren. Could I tell you something? When Cain took the life of Abel, when Cain slew Abel, 
He did not just slay his brother, but he killed his nephews and his nieces and all of his brother's children and grandchildren for the generations to come. When you take a person's life, you're not only taking their life, but you're killing their seed from making other human beings. And that scripture says, thy brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Can I please tell you that we're now in a race for the presidency of the United States. And every time this rolls around, every four years, there's people that runs for president that takes a strong stand against abortion. And every time they do, each four years it gets more severe. And the elite media begins to blast the one that tries to take a stand for the sanctity of life. Even we have seen others that's running for president this time in the Republican Party, how they're beginning to take a lot of hits because they're trying to stand up for the sanctity of life. America may not think it's important, friend, but I'm telling you, it's a majorly important issue in this coming up election. May God have mercy on us if we don't stop the shedding of innocent blood. Watch this. Also, if you go back in the days of Moses, you remember? His mother took him and she hid him. Why did she hide him? Because Pharaoh had put out an edict that all the male children would be killed and drowned in the river of the Nile and all the female babies would be saved alive, but all the male children would be killed. And so Jochebed, Moses' mother, fixed a bulrush and she pitched it inside and out for him that he would be saved. And Pharaoh said in chapter 1, verse 22 of Exodus, it said, Pharaoh charged all of his people, saying, Every son that's born, cast them into the river where the crocodiles are. And every daughter, save them. So Pharaoh demanded that the midwives kill the male children. And the babies were to be fed to the crocodiles. And then God raised up Moses one day. His mother built him a bulrush, and he's raised up in Pharaoh's household. One day he decided not to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter anymore, and he began to move toward the Hebrew people. And God raised him up, and he, he tried to deliver the children of Israel, but he did it in the wrong way and had to roam for 40 years on the backside of the desert. And finally God appeared to him in the burning bush, and God said, I want you to go, and I want you to do what I tell you to do and say what I tell you to say. And so he went before Pharaoh. And the very first judgment that God sent on Pharaoh Moses said, let God's people go. And he said, no. And the very first judgment that came on Egypt, the Lord said unto Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened, and he refused to let the people go. Go into Pharaoh in the morning, and he goes out to the water. Stand by the river's brink against it when he comes, and the rod which was turned into a serpent, take it in your hand. And you'll say to him, the Lord God of the Hebrews has sent me unto you, saying, let my people go, that they may serve me in the wilderness. And behold, hitherto you would not. Thus saith the Lord, in this shall you know that I am the Lord. I will smite with the rod that is in my hand upon the waters which are in the river, and they shall be turned to blood. The fish that's in the river shall die, and the river shall stink, and the Egyptians shall loathe to drink of the water of the river. And the Lord spake unto Moses, and he said, Say unto Aaron, Take the rod, stretch out your hand upon the waters of Egypt, and upon their streams, and upon their rivers, and their ponds, and upon all the pools of water, that they may become blood. And there may be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, both in vessels of wood and in vessels of stone. And they did so. And the Lord commanded, and he lifted up his rod and smote the waters. And the Bible says in verse 21, The fish that was in the river died, the river stank, the Egyptians could not drink the water of the river, and there was blood throughout all the land of Egypt. Why? Because they cast those male children into that river, and now later when God goes to deliver the children of Israel, he remembered the blood of those dead male babies, and God turned the Nile into blood and made them drink it. Can I tell you something else? Have you ever wondered why the walls of Jericho fell and no other walls fell of any other cities? When the children of Israel came in and the walls of Jericho fell, there were 10 cities that they took of Canaan. The first city was Jericho. Why did the walls fall? It's interesting. Because they would offer their children to idols 
and the bones that would be left of their children, they put in clay jars, and they buried in clay jars the bones of their children in the walls around Jericho. So Joshua, after Moses' death, Joshua led the children of Israel into Jericho, and he said to the children of Israel, march around one time a day, seven days on the seventh day, march seven times, blow the trumpets, and the walls will fall, and whenever the walls fell, all those clay jars that were hidden in the walls of Jericho was exposed, and the bones of those children came floating out. God brought judgment in the area where they tried to bury their sin. Could I take it another step further? In the days of Solomon, they had an idol god on the western part of Jerusalem in the valley of Hinnon, and they had an idol god by the name of Molech. And it had the head of a bull, and it had the body of a man, and it was a big idol that they had created out of cast iron. And the belly of that idol was open, and that's where the heathen would cause their children to pass through the fire. I want to show you a scripture in the Bible of what God warned Moses about. He said, tell the children of Israel. He said, they're not make their children pass through the fire. Look at this. He said, there shall not be found any among you, anyone that makes his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that uses divination, or observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch. God said, none to make his son or daughter go through the fire. Look at this, please. Isn't it interesting that all the kings that would come after, including Solomon, David's own son, Solomon that built the temple, Solomon that restored Jerusalem to its splendor and its glory. Isn't it amazing that Solomon married, married, false, married heathen wives and they had their false gods and they taught in that heathen worship these wives that Solomon married, they taught that their children must pass through the fire and the wisest man that ever lived recanted and he began to let his children pass through the fire. Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived. And isn't it interesting, when God brought judgment after Jesus, they came to Jesus and said, let's show you Solomon's temple. Jesus said, there's coming a time that one, not one stone will be left upon another. And what he was saying was, when they come in and they ransack Jerusalem and burn it, the fire is going to become so hot, it's going to melt the gold in the dome, and it's going to come down in the mortar of the stones of the temple and they're going to take the stones apart to get the gold, and there won't be one stone left upon another. And it was fire that destroyed the temple because Solomon let his children pass through the fire. Here's one of the things I want to say to you today as I get ready to close. I don't think you and I don't think myself really realizes how perilously close we are in this nation to swift judgment. It's right at the door. It's because we're shedding innocent blood. Look at Iran killing the pastor that refused to re deny Islam, or he refused to, deny, de refused to deny Christianity and embrace Islam. That's what you call shedding of innocent blood. I don't know if they've killed him yet or not. I haven't heard. I don't know if his life's been taken yet. But that shedding of innocent blood, and that brings swift retribution and swift judgment upon a nation. Here's what I want to say to you in closing. Now can you understand why the Bible says in 2 Chronicles 7 and 14, if my people who are called by my name will first of all humble themselves. You know what humble yourself means? If they will repent, not just pray. He says to pray, but the first thing he says is to repent, humble yourself. That's what the church doesn't want to do today. We don't want to humble ourselves. If we will humble ourselves and if we will pray, and then he says, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, he said, 
I will hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. Last week I had a dream, and I close with this. It was a very real dream to me, and it shook me. I can't say that it was an angel because he didn't look anything like an angel, but a man came to me and he said, come here, I want to show you something. And we went over to a shaft that went down in the earth, and it was sort of like an elevator. And I got on this shaft with him, he on one side and I on the other side, and we went down, 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 way down in the heart of the earth. And when we got all the way down, there was a little room there, and there was a table in this room. And he sat on one side of the table, and I sat on the other side of the table. And he took with his finger, and he pointed, and he said, Do you see this area right here? He said, This is where it will start. He said, The fountains of the, of the deep will begin to break up right here. And as soon as he said, The fountains of the deep breaking up, it reminded me of the days of Noah. And the Bible said in the days of Noah that not only did it rain from the heavens, but the fountains of the great deep broke up and it, it, the water came up from the earth. And this being said, he said there's, right here is where it's going to start. And then it showed, I just saw a surge of water, unbelievable water. I don't think there would be any way that Hollywood could re recreate it. It just gushed from the earth and immediately just, it, we, we was on top of the earth then. And it just gushed like an ocean coming from the hearts of the earth. And the one thing that he said to me that I didn't forget and I still got it in my head is he said, the devastation and the destruction will be severely widespread. And then he showed me a land mass and I don't know where the land mass is. I could not point it out to you again if I tried. I don't know if it was Alabama. I don't know if it was America. I don't know where it was. But I saw a land mass, and I saw water wrapping around the land mass. It was not an ocean. It was not a river. It was not a lake, but it looked sort of like a bay around this land mass. And all of a sudden, I saw the thing just violently quake, and water came up from the heart of the earth and just flooded it immediately. And it shook me. And whenever I came awake from my dream, I didn't feel like I had been in a dream. I felt like I'd been in a class where I was instructed. And the thing that the Holy Spirit said to me was, he said, son, use your voice and bring a warning to my people. Because he said, there is a severity of the times and judgment is at the door. So tonight, I'm going to leave that with you. And I'm going to ask you, if you will, to join me and help me intercede. We're going to close the service a little bit different tonight. We told you, we both told you in the beginning this is going to be a little bit different service. But I feel in my spirit that there's something right at the door. And it's severe judgment that's right at the door. And I believe before too very long, we're all going to see it. I don't know what. Don't know when, don't know where. I wish I could tell you, but I don't. But I think it's incumbent on us tonight to stand in just a moment. Don't do it right now, but we're going to stand in just a moment. And I want you to begin to help me intercede. And I want you to lift your voice. You can feel free to leave the pew where you are and just walk around. And we're going to make this a prayer meeting tonight. But we're going to ask God for mercy on America. Would you do that? And we're going to, have, we're going to ask God to have mercy upon us. That the sins that we need to repent of and the sins that we need to humble ourselves and ask God to forgive us and ask others to forgive us. We're going to make things right tonight. Would you do that right now? If you will, stand with me. And I want you to begin right now to lift up your voices and let's cry out to the Lord. Come on, church. Just begin to lift your voices right now. <laughs> Just feel free to begin to move around. Come on, lift your voice. It's okay. Come on, church. Come on, help me. Come on, lift your voice. Let's intercede. 
Şüleli bir yalala bas, şala bas, sandal alabalı bir yandı. I feel this. I feel this. It's time to pray. It's time to repent. Şüleli bir yalala bas, şala bas, sandal alabalı bir yandı. Lord, I'm the one who shall abandon the one who is under. Me, Lord, I'm the one who shall be answered. Maria, the one who shall abandon the one who is under. Come on, cry out. What's on the inside of you? Let it out. Just begin to cry out to the Lord. It's all right. 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 May there be a sound in this place of weeping between the porch and the altar. Why don't you find a prayer partner right quick and just begin to join hands and let's pray together. Come on, merge your voices together. Come on, find a prayer partner. Ladies with ladies and men with men. Yes, Lord. That's it. Come on. That's it. That's it. Lord, I feel that. That's it. Come on, church. Those of you at home, join us in prayer. Those of you watching my God TV, begin to intercede right now. Begin to intercede for our leaders. Begin to intercede for our nation. My God, I feel that. Come on. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. Mare de de biyana la bossa la mandala la bobiyanda. Hila la la bossa la bossa la mandala la bobiyanda. It's time to cry out, friend, it's time to cry out.
Bola basando. Yes. My God, feel that. Feel that. I tell you, there's intercession in this house right now. Come on, church. Lift your voice. Those of you at home, lift your voice. It's time to call upon the Lord, friend. It's time to call upon the Lord. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Holy, 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 holy. Holy is the Lord. Holy is the Lord. Holy is the Lord. Woo! Feel that. Something's in this place. Something is broke loose in this place. I can feel it. I said, I can feel it. Something is broke loose in this house. Woo! Mighty God. Mighty God. Shele Bayanda. Hallelujah.
Come on, call upon the name of the Lord. Call. People that are watching around the world, join right now with this cry. Join with this cry tonight. I believe that the ear of the Lord is hearing right now. I believe the hand of the Lord will turn. For those who will call upon the name of the Lord. Jesus. 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 Let the nations cry out to you tonight, Lord. Those of you with family members that are lost, cry out. God, God, we need you, Lord, we need you, Lord, refine us, Father. Something's happening tonight, church. I want you to go with this right now. Follow the Holy Ghost. Just go with it right now. Whew. Jesus. 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 Whew. 
Jesus. 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 Lord, let us turn back to you. Let our hearts turn back to you. There's a powerful anointing in this place right now. Oh God, oh God, Spirit of God, would you break every perversion from my generation? Those spirits of perversion, the filth of pornography, oh God. Listen, I feel this so strong right now. Some of you, even as you're stood there praying, the Spirit of God is already convicting your heart. I want to tell you it's easy. It's so easy to at one time in your life be on fire for God, to burn with a passion. That you never would have done what you do today and said that you serve Jesus Christ. Things that have crept into your life because of apathy. The call 
call to revival is first for your heart, for your heart to come back to your first love. Something disastrous happens when a life that burns for Jesus, that burn with the Holy Ghost, something disastrous happens when the world starts to creep in. Not all at once, but over days, over hours, over weeks, over months, over years, through disappointment, through the devil beginning just to try and get you to bite. And now you wonder why the fire has died inside of you. You wonder why you can be in the presence of God and everybody else has got their eyes fixed on Jesus, but you're dead inside. You're dead. People go to church, they get in this atmosphere. And people that even think they love the Lord want to get out. They want to get out. Some of them are already thinking of habits that they have that they don't want to let go. Well, I've been okay. God's still blessing me. My friend, if it wasn't for the blood of Jesus Christ, if it wasn't for him enduring with you, don't believe the lies of the devil that say it's okay. It's not okay. Young man, I want to tell you, Young women, and I'm preaching to older ones too. Don't dance with the devil. Don't dance with him. Don't let him waltz you. Don't let him serenade you. Don't ever, ever think that you're too good. I know tonight, right on this first night, there are people watching at home right now. You're watching that TV set, and inside your heart, you're fighting right now. My friend, I'm going to tell you, this message of repentance, a message of revival, America is about to hear it one more time. But my friend... If you walk out and you want to hold on to that sin, you've just let go of Jesus. If you love the world more than you love him, you're not worthy of him. I know the church has told you, if you just have a bit of counseling, that'll do it. If you love this world and the things of this world, Jesus said, not a pastor, not a denomination, the Lamb of God, the Son of God said, you are not worthy of me. How can we ask God to give his all and we give him but a part? How can you ask God to call you his own? When you dance with the devil, I feel this tonight, and this is what we're going to do right now. I'm telling you, I don't need to labor with you. Ushers, you're going to clear these aisles. Men and women, young and old, I don't care whether you've got a title. You might be a big somebody, you brought somebody tonight and they think you're the best thing since sliced bread. I'm telling you right now, God is touching your heart. He's giving you a call right now. 
You're going to run. You're going to get out of your rows. You're going to get out of your seats. You're going to make your way. I don't care who's watching you. Who says, where are you going? Tell them, I'm going to the front. I got business to do with God. I got to get myself right tonight. Not tomorrow. Not next week. Right now. Tonight is my night. Listen, we're going to pray for the sick tonight. We're going to begin and let these three nights, God's glory is going to be awesome. But I know something special is at hand when God on the first night brings the message of repentance to the heart. You see, when people start to get right with God, some of you students, I want to tell you, listen to me. I don't care what your friends are doing. I don't care what they're doing. You already know. The Spirit of God has been dealing with you. Don't do it, son. Don't do that, daughter. No. The Bible says, grieve not the Holy Ghost. Grieve him not. I'm going to make a call. We're going to play this song one through. And I'm going to call you. I'm going to bind the devil. And listen, some of you, you're going to fight all the way. But if you have to fight all the way, then don't stop fighting until you get down here. Some of you are going to listen to the whisper of the devil that says, you're okay. You're okay. Let me tell you what you do. You'll have a few seconds. If you don't heed the call, that chain will stay wrapped around you. And you'll leave with the same bondage, the same addiction. I met a man one time, he drinks every night, he's a drunkard, but in some church in America, they told him once saved, always saved. Don't you worry about it. Don't you worry about it. You said a sinner's prayer, it's all okay. I want to tell you, I don't know where they get that from. I don't know where it comes from. The book of Revelation speaks of your name being blotted out from the Lamb's book of life. I want to ask you a question. How can a name be blotted out unless it was once first written? There are those that are the, your name was written in the Lamb's book of life. Do you know what it cost your Savior that an angel could write your name in the Lamb's book of life? Oh, how it would grieve the heart of God if one day your name was being removed. Many will say on that day, Lord, didn't we cast out devils? And the Lord will say, Go from me. I know. My friend, I want to tell you right now, generation, those that are watching at home, narrow is the way. Narrow is the way. Narrow is the way. Broad is the way that leads to hell, and many shall go in by it. But narrow is the way that leads to salvation. I don't care how long you've been saved. If you ever arrive at a place that you can't get right with God, you've lost your salvation. You've lost your first love. People want hands laid on them for impartation. They want that anointing. They want the glory. But they don't want to lay before God and get their lives right. Put their lives in a place where God can use them. My friend, that sin's got to go right now. And what I love about the gospel, what I love about revival, what I love about the power of the Holy Ghost is that any man, any woman, any child, no matter what your background, where you're from, if you would just open up your heart, if you would just come to the Savior, if you would come back to your first love, God is faithful to wash you and set you ablaze with the fire of God. You could go out of here burning, burning. Stand to your feet all over this place. Those of you at home right now, I know you're in your house. But I'm telling you, you're going to get out of that couch, you're going to get out of that chair, and you're going to kneel right down in your home. You're going to kneel. The eye of the Lord is going to watch. His ear is going to hear, and he'll hear your cry. No matter how many times you've run from God, 
Some of you have got to say tonight is a night that I'm going to get right with God. No devil, no man, no woman, no pride is going to stop me. Lydia's going to sing this song. I'm going to begin to pray. I'm going to bind the devil. I'm going to bind those lies over your life. I'm tired of hearing about young men and young women in Bible schools where the devil lured you in, hooked you, and destroyed your destiny. Let me tell you, Bible school should be the place of revival. If there's ever a place of revival where there's young men so on fire for God, so full of the Holy Ghost. It's time to let holiness reign in our hearts and tonight's the night. Tonight's your night. Lydia, begin to play. Father, in the name of Jesus, I bind every lie of the devil. I break every stronghold. And I call every sinner to repentance. I call every man, every woman that you're dealing with right now. Lord, in the name of Jesus, let them run to your arms tonight. Those that are watching at home, in the name of Jesus Christ, break every chain. Lord, I call those. I call them right now out of their sin out of darkness if you know God is speaking to you come on right now in Jesus name come out of your row come out of your seat right now right now right now right now come on come on come on come on right in come on 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 right now quickly quickly come on come on come on Right now, quickly, quickly, come on, quickly. In the name of Jesus, come on, let's just bring them right in. Let's just bring them right in. Come on, come on. Let's just let them in, come on, right now, quickly, quickly, come on, come on. Quickly, right now. Come on. In the name of Jesus. Come on. Come on, friend, right now. Quickly, we're waiting. In the name of Jesus, come on. Come on. Come on. Let's just let these people in right now. Come on. Come on, friend. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Right now, come on. People are coming right now, but I got a word right now. And I know this is for multiple people. I don't know whether you're in this room. I know some are in here right now. But I want to tell that man right now, sir, if you'd stop ringing those chat lines in the night hours, if you'd stop speaking to those women of perversion, God will restore your marriage, not tomorrow, right now. And the Lord says the problem is not in your wife, it is in your heart. It is in your heart. For already in your heart, you've left your wife. But right now in Jesus' name, right now before a holy God, if you would open your heart and get down here, bring your wife, God will restore you. I said, God will restore you. Play that one more time quickly, Lydia. Play it. Come on, friend, right now. Come on. If you know you need to be here, 
Come on. Come on. Come on. God bless you. Come on. Come on. Ushers. Ushers, you've got to let these people in. Come on. Come on. Those of you at home right now, get before God. Just bow your knee right now. In Jesus' mighty name. across the nations of the world tonight. Let multitudes be saved. Let the cry of repentance resound. Those of you in this altar right now, just put your eyes on Jesus right now and just begin to let him touch your heart. Just let him touch you. Just ask him right now for his spirit to come on you and to cleanse you. If you have addictions in your life, lay those addictions down right now. Let those addictions fall right now. Father, in Jesus' name, Talk to God right now. Let it out. Let it out. Let it out. Jesus. There it is. There it is. Let it out. Let it out. You and maybe you spent years of your life, years of your life, going around in circles, the same old sin. But tonight in the name of Jesus, I break that cycle right now. The Spirit of God is touching hearts right now. Spirit of God, cleanse every heart. If you have addictions in your life, cry out right now. Cry out. Let those chains be broken right now. Father, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. is falling in this altar right now. Church, pray all over this place right now. <sighs> Let the blood of Jesus right now break every chain. Loose every bondage. Father, let a cry of holiness, let the fear of God fall in this altar right now. <sighs> Father, you see every heart, you know every life.
Something's happening in this altar right now. Don't stop. Just let God touch your heart. Open up your mouth right now. Tell him. Tell him right now. you to stand with me please we're going to pray the prayer together if you will everybody stand with me and the, those of you in the altars we're going to pray together i want everybody in the audience if you will just extend your hands this way i'd like for everybody to pray this prayer out loud with me including those here especially these here but i want everybody in the audience to pray with me those of you at home please feel free to, free to pray this prayer i want you to pray it out loud don't mumble it i want you to pray it out loud dear jesus I come to you, I confess with my mouth that I have sinned and I have fallen short of your expectations of me. Lord, I have sinned against you, I have sinned against myself, and I have sinned against others. I ask you, Lord, for mercy, and I ask that the blood of your son Jesus would cleanse me and wash me from all unrighteousness. Lord, everything that I have done, that I have said, that I have thought, that has offended you, Lord, wash me. I ask that your Holy Spirit would come into my heart and give me power to live the life as a Christian. Lord, in the name of Jesus, give me the strength to turn my back on sin, on the flesh, and on the devil. I ask you, Lord, put people in my life that will help me walk with you and serve you. Lord, I give up those people in my life that's a bad influence for me I love them and I'll pray for them but I'll turn away from them I will not let them lead me anymore down the wrong path strengthen me Holy Spirit walk with me talk with me in Jesus name amen let's give the Lord a big hand clap hallelujah Those of you that want prayer, I want you to go ahead and come forward. She's going to lead us in some worship. We're going to pray for everybody here. Should I find out my soul? 